Okay. So in our previous class, we tried to introduce Express. And we discussed about how Express simplifies all the complexities in Node.js. And we talked about basic routing and we created a Hello World application. And today we will move further by learning how we can serve static files in Express. And then we we'll also talk about middleware, the application level middleware, router level middleware, and the route level middleware. Where after that, we we'll move to setting up our task manager project. Okay, so let's get to work. So in Express service static files, we don't Express is um a server side framework. So if you want to serve static files like HTML images or um CSS files, you just don't serve files like that. And it's an issue we encountered in our previous class. Let's start our server then. Okay. This Express. Then we start our server. And we're having server running on port undefined. Because look at our port up here and look at our dot env config down here. So we're trying to initialize the port to 3000 before configuring our file. So we'll move this down here like this. Now you can see server running on port 3000. Okay, so now we're good to go. So um, serving static files in Express is not a big deal. We'll first of all, create a folder here. And we name it public. And then inside the public, we create an index HTML file. So, then we'll give it a H1 um, task manager, like so. Yeah. So now we'll come back in our index file. Then we see app use. Express, Express static, they will give it a public, like so. Okay, so now we, let's, okay, let's go to localhost. Three thousand, and we can see our tax manager right there. Well, if you go to like, uh, let's say tasks. What do we have here? We have a task uh, route here. A, a test, not tasks, please. Tests. We have hello world because this is actually what we are serving hello world. But without going to the test route. We're basically serving our file. And then we can do something like, we can even create index and CSS file. 
then we can see each one. Then we can give it a color of um, aqua. We can give it, let's say, font family, like so. We'll come down here, we'll say, um, Fira code, like so. Okay. Come here, let's link it to our HTML, uh, index HTML file. Link, it says CSS, you can say index CSS, like so. Let's try to view it in the browser and see what you've got. Let's refresh. A hair. Oh, the color is. Uh, let's give it a color of. Basically, uh, blue or Doja, Doja blue. Yeah. Let's refresh and see what you've got. A hair task manager with. Font style of uh Fira code, and that's basically how we can serve our self static files. Okay, and you can do anything serving static files, you can serve anything, you can serve images, you can serve CSS files, you can serve. HTML files as we're serving public, and you can serve anything. So that's basically how to serve uh, static files, or you can even do something like um, dialing, process, this and that. Oh, but we're not using, what we're using here is modules, not uh, um, common JS. So we don't have to go about configuring the dial name before Doing that we just say express that this is the root the root is public and express and everything for us under the hood okay so now let's move to let's move to our middleware and under middleware we're going to be starting with uh the we're going to be starting with application level middleware so what is an application level middleware? An application level middleware uh, in, in Express just refers to like a, a middleware functions that is applied to an entire application rather than a specific router or route like um, these middleware functions are, are executed for every incoming HTTP request, regardless of their route or URL requested or um, so on. They are typically used for use for tasks that need to be performed globally across your application, such as uh, setting up common headers, handling authentication, or logging. Okay. So we all know what an application level midway is. It's applied to the whole of your application to handle headers and every other thing you need to handle. You can apply it anywhere that you apply to the whole of your application. So let's assume we want, we need an application level middleware. So what we do right here is, um, What's this? What's happening? Okay. What we do right here is at the top of our file after the express use static, we see app use. What we are doing here, we are pushing this into our middleware stack. We are pushing this middleware into our middleware stack. Our middlewares are executed in the order they are being pushed. So in this uh, file, the first middleware will, will be executed. That is the express static. And then the second one, which is this one we are defining right now. And remember, a middleware is basically a function. So what we take here, we take in a request. 
the response, and then a next function. So inside of the next function, inside of this UI uh, function, we just see log global middleware, like so. And then so that we pass the execution context to the next middleware in our application. So let's now make a request to, you know what? We're gonna be using Postman. So open your Postman. No, you don't need to open it because just focus on the video. Then later when you, when you want to work, um, you want to practice this, you just use Postman. But today we're not gonna be explain, uh, me exploring uh, Postman. We just use it to test our application, but then I will explain some few things. But we get to testing our APIs and then we will explore uh, Postman in depth. Okay. So now let's add a request. Let's see HTTP slash slash local localhost 3000. Okay, so let's send this request and see. The 200 with the document of body. So can I take this up a bit? Like so. With the body of H1 task manager. And we can see our CSS is being linked to our file. So that's working. And then let's go to tests. And then we'll send our request again. And then we'll have hello world. And then let's come back to our file and we'll see global middleware. Can you see this? Because our middleware is being applied to each and every um, function in our file. If we add another method here and we make a request to that method, then this middleware, let's say we we'll add a post request. Let's see, post app dot post test. I'll do something. Let's copy this function here. Then paste it in here. Here we say post requests like so. Let's go back to Postman and then change this to post like this and then send the request again. Then we have post request. Okay, let's come back to our file and see what we've got. We still have our global middleware. That means that this is an application level middleware and it's applied to every part of our application. Not just this file, but every part of our application. So, Basically, what you we, what we are trying to do here, we import the Express uh, framework, then we create an instance. Then we define an application level middleware using the function app.use, app use. Yeah, Mose, go on. Good day, sir. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, regarding the our uh, application middleware, when do you think is the right time to use it in our application? Okay when you want to log requests or it's being used in load balancers and proxies, reverse proxies and all of that. We get to that. We just get to understand the basics first, then we get to apply it. Where okay, we sir. Yeah. So um, the steps, I was trying to explain how we used our middleware. We import the Express framework, then we create an instance, an app instance on the Express framework. Then we define an application level using the app use. This app use simply pushes this uh, middleware and our middleware stack. And then this middleware text three arguments, which is a request, a response, and the request is a request object. The response is a response object. There's a rec request object. The rest is a response object. Then the next, it's a function that passes control to the next middleware or, or um, route handler. Then 
in this example, what we simply do, we log a message. Or we can you can perform more complex uh, tasks here. Um, after uh, logging a message, then we pass control to this uh, test here. Then we this test response sends back hello world. Then this video will execute. But when we make a post request, this doesn't execute. So the next uh, route here, which is the test and it's a post. Uh, method it gets executed and then we also execute our our middleware which is an application level middleware it can get executed anywhere okay so that's it for the application level middleware we just get to understand the basics first then we'll use it in an in application later on but for now let's keep it that way okay so now let's move to an application, no, so the router level middleware. And the router level middleware in Express just refers to middleware functions that are applied to specific group of routes. Um, typically organized under a specific router object. And this allows us to define middleware that will only be executed for routes associated with that router. Make it, making it a more uh, fine-grained way to like apply middleware to specific parts of our application. So this may get confusing, but then let's try to understand what's really going on here. Okay, so what we do is we'll comment out this. Comment out this one, and then we'll we see up here we see um, const router is equal to express router. Okay, so now we want to define a router le uh, level middleware function. So we say instead of app use, we say router use we we'll push this middleware to our router level middleware uh, stack then the same thing here let's just copy this function like so and then bring it up here then uncomment it like so let me see router level middleware Okay, now you can notice how we're calling our next to pass control to the next uh, middleware function. And then let's see uh, router get test. Then we pass in the rec res. And then we'll send back res.send. So oh, it's response, not rec. Rest send router level. Something like this. We just see the router level. And then we want to use, we want to use, as you can clearly see here, the router itself is a middleware. So we're creating a router and we want this uh, middleware to be applied on only this router, but then we want to use this router in our application. So finally, what we will say is app use, um, let's say test, and then let's remove this. Thing. Let me leave it like that so I will show you what's going on. Test, and then we use our router like so. Okay, so the router itself, it's an application level middleware. Then here, this middleware defined inside of the router that is pushed inside of the router level middleware and stack. It's a router level middleware, but the router is, a, is an application level middleware. 
So now let's make a request. We, as you can see, we're having test and test because we're using our router in our application. So let's see what happens if we make our request to test. We're having a test here. So let's make a request. I can see title error cannot post to test. Okay, let's just change it to get because we don't have any. Let's send it again. Error cannot get slash test. And the reason why is because we're having a test here and we're having another test here. So that should be something like slash test, like this slash test. So let's make a request again. And we're having our router level. So if you don't want to have something like this, what you will do is either you come here and make this a slash or you come down here and make it a slash like so. And let's first of all test this one and see what we've got. Error cannot get slash test. Okay, let's remove this one and then make the request again. I can see router level middleware. But if you just leave this test and then come up here and make remove this one, make it a slash so that way you are making a subsequent request. Like let's say you are adding a, a post a, a post method, you simply add a slash instead of adding test 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 because the test is already handled here for you. So you only add a slash, meaning it's slash test. So you come down here. Then you make a request again and you have your router level, which is fine. And then check here. Can you see what's being logged? Router level middleware. We're applying our middleware to this. Uh, but if you, if you do something like app get test, now let's let's make a request to this. Um, let's say, let's say, let's name it a test uh, index, like so. And then let's make a request with this uh, test index. <laughs> and let's see what we've got. Come here and make a request to test index. Hello world. But then if you come to your terminal and then view your terminal, you are not seeing this uh, router level midway. Sorry. This... <laughs> okay. If you come to your terminal now, you are not seeing this. Um, Router level middleware because it's not an application level middleware, but it's a router level middleware. So it's not being applied to our whole application. It's only applied to this uh, router we are using here. Okay, and that's that's just awesome. That's awesome. Okay, so uh, let me try to explain step by step what just happened. We created an express application and then initiated an instance of router on the router um object inside of the express object so when we create this the router is a, a, a mini express application that can have its own middleware and route so we we define a router level middleware from using the router use this middle this middleware function will only be executed for routes that are defined under this router in this example it logs a message but as we earlier said, you can perform more complex um, tasks in that uh, middleware. So we defined the get route where we send back um, router level for our, for our use case. So that's just it for the router level middleware. We've seen how we can use our router level middleware in this file. And then what's next on our list is um, the route level middleware and the route level middleware in express refers to a middleware function that uh, that is applied to specific to a specific route let's see for example unlike um application level middleware which is executed for all routes the route level middleware is applied only to the route where it is explicitly defined so this allows you to add middleware for specific routes to perform tasks such as a uh, authentication, input validation, or login for a specific route, not the whole application or a whole router or something like that. So without speaking uh, too much English, let's see how we can uh, implement um, um, 
a route level middleware. So what you will do is um you come down here and comment this out. And we'll comment this out as well. And this one. Okay. So now we'll come here. I'll do something like define the middleware. You see function log request. And then this log request will take in a, a request object, a response object, and then the next function that passes a, a control to the next middleware function, log request. So what you want to do in this log request, you simply say log um, received Receive um, see request method. Receive the request method, and then see request method uh, request to let's say request path. No, Oops, what am I doing? Request. But like so. Okay, and then after that, I want to pass control to the next middleware function. And always have it in mind that if you don't call the next function, the next middleware, this middleware will not be applied to, to your route because it will execute and will not pass control. So it will not be applied to your route. So always make sure you call the next function to pass control to the next middleware in the stack. So here we'll come and then we'll see app get test index. Then here we'll pass in our log request middleware like so. This is a route, the route level middleware, and this here is a route. So we'll just pass it in here. And then let me let me uncomment this post like so. So that we test both of them. Okay. So now let's um test our test index route. We have test index, send a request. Then we have hello word. Then we come down here. Then we check okay, request, get request to slash test index. Can you see that? And that is sweet. Received get request to test index. Then, but then this is only applied to this route. It is not applied to the last, uh, the post, uh, this test post route. So let's check it out if it's working as required. Then let's change it to test and then make a request. Then we have post requests. But if you come down to your console, you are not having any logs. This is our previous uh, request, the previous request we made slash test index. And now we're making a request to test. So this was logged earlier, not now. So let's make the request again like two, one, two. Okay, then we come down here because nothing is happening because it's only applied to this route. So we've come to the conclusion of uh, middlewares. Don't take middlewares for granted because Express itself is a middleware framework. Without middlewares, Express is useless. You can't do anything with Express. As you can see, this Express static, this is a middleware. It's pushing this Express static to the middleware stack. And the middlewares are executed in the order they are being pushed to the stack. You know what a stack is? A stack data structure. Like let's say a stack, it's when you it's it's last in first out. That is lifo, last in first out. The last item pushed on the stack is the first one that will be removed. You understand? So in this case, we have our middlewares here. Like so. And JavaScript execution is top down. So we start with its execution here. It comes here like this, like this, like this. It get to this place. 
then it will check. What about the our is our URL? If it finds out that our URL is just the the domain, let's say the HTTP slash three thousand without no route, like so, then it will send back the the static. So this is a post request and not a get request. Uh, to send back the our static file and not any meaningful stuff. But then after this, if the, the we have we add another route like test index, it will proceed to the next middleware. That doesn't match anything, so it will proceed to the next middleware and it will check. Does it match? Yes, it matches. Then it will return this. The response will return this. Okay, so that's just it for middleware. Now, okay, we have. Sorry, no, no, no. It's not on. To... Okay, so now we have. Um, The next is on our list is our text task manager project using Express and an ORM. And the reason why I wanted I wanted to like show us how to use Express with databases without using ORMs, but then I decided not to because that is outside of this um this course entirely. I would just teach you how to use Express with databases and ORMs and then how to optimize them. Because not all of us are interested in learning the raw database syntax like SQL and then learning Mongoose for MongoDB. Not all of us are interested in all that. And that is the more reason why I chose uh, Prisma. Prisma is a cross-platform RM, object uh, relational mapping. And we'll talk about that in our next class when we start talking about working with databases, where we will learn how to use Prisma with MongoDB and then we learn how to use Prisma with SQL databases. But in this very class for today, we are going to be learning how to use Prisma with SQLite. And SQLite is an SQL database for development purposes because it lacks permission in production, especially when hosted, when the application is hosted on serverless, um, hosted with serverless functions it lacks permissions so it's mostly used in development and mini blogs because and it lacks uh, concurrency as well as well because if you have too many requests like too many if your if your application is experiencing traffic it will it will go down because sqlite is is, is very light and that's the reason why it's named sqlite so without talking too much, let's sequelize things with Express. Let's express our sequelizing, or let's sequelize our expressions. Oh, that's sweet, that's sweet. And let's try to sequelize our expressions. But then, first of all, we have to close this, close this, close this. And before we go forward, I want you to pay good attention because I, I just I don't want only I don't want you to understand only Express or Node.js. I want you to understand server side. I want you to understand back end development. I want you to understand server side as a whole, because understanding Express and uh, Node.js only it's not um, that I do. As a back end developer, maybe you may find yourself in an environment where you are the CTO the chief technical officer or you are the the lead the the lead the team lead which will be taking care of the dev ops you will be um optimizing workflows or you'll be doing all kind of things you know and then you will need to know all these things where you handle but then we get to that in a minute we still have much more time to discuss everything we discuss testing unit testing with um Let's just leave that for some other time. But for now, let's try to set up our task manager application with uh, Express. So let's make this directory of uh, Express 
task manager like so and then let's move into it express like so no express it will be express no. manager like so okay so we are in our folder and then now in setting up our projects what are we first going to do we create a package of jc this is our folder right here and there's nothing inside so we initialize a package jc see npm initialize as yes do it automatically for us like so okay and then we have our package jc and then we create a source folder inside our application because we want our application to be organized a source folder like so so the main um file is inside the source slash index it's inside the source folder so we make it like so and then though some hosting services use this to start and monitor your application but then i i adapt if i'm going to need it but if i'm going to need it i will still talk about it okay and that's it the description is um express task manager like this and then we say we want to use modules type module like so and then the keywords we say um express prisma um sqlite like so and then author will say code camp like so and then what do we have okay so earlier we discussed about nodemon you can search for nodemon and then try to read the documentation. There are other things you can use Nodemon to do. And as well, we're going to know the difference between development. We discussed, we discussed that earlier as well. Development dependencies and then the dependencies that, to, that are to be used both in development and production. So let's, first of all, we start with some development dependencies here. We install, um, we need Nodemon as a development dependency, and then we need .m. No, .m is a production dependency because we have to load some of the environmental variables in production. So it's it's a production uh, dependency. But then let's install a development dependency. That is a Nodemon. So we can start and start application and then develop application effectively without having to stop and start again. We see, see you know, in production, we want to start application with node. We want to know just to start application for because it's in production and the server will not go down. So the server, the server will handle stopping and starting our application. Our application we don't have to, we know stop. Once it starts. It will, it will not stop because it's in production and we have to, our application in production have to keep running and running and running, except the, the server is down. If the server is not down, it will keep running. So we don't have to use node mode. All we have to use is node. Node will start application once and then it will, it will keep running. But then our index file is in the source directory. So we say index.js. Then, okay, okay. Of this face, cut it, save, don't save because of the changes. Package JC, not one. Okay, and start node of node is start application for us in production, but then in development, we want we can start something like start, say something like start dev start development, but that is, let's say development, let's say dev, like so. And then node mode will take care of this for us. And our index file is in the source directly, like so. Index JS, then put a comma if not to get an error. Okay. So now this is the basic, this is our basic package JSON file. Then we install Express as a development dependency. I mean, as, product, as a dependency, as a normal dependency. 
I'm using both in production and then development. So you see npm install express and then dot dot env dot env dot env like so. And then we come down here where it's installing. We create an index js file index js file. And the first thing we'll do here is use strict so that we can be able to catch almost every error in your application. And then we've installed um, the, the dot env and the express. I believe many of us don't know the meaning of this. Uh, is this, what is this called? Is it a carrot or something like that? We don't, this um, up arrow something. The use for this is since NPM, initially uh, before NPM version five or so, I prefer using YAN because in YAN it takes care of um, keeping your dependency, the way you install them, not updating them. But listen, the meaning of this thing here is if you clone, if you later in one year or two years clone this repository from GitHub and you try to install these dependencies, you run npm install, it will install these same dependencies without changing them. Or well, if you don't have something like this and you try to install, you, you run uh, npm install after cloning this uh, repo, this will update to the latest version of .env and it may cause your application to break because you don't know which dependencies are compatible with the peer dependencies of this and all of that. So it's good. NPM just added this behind the hood for us. So later on, if you clone this app, except you run NPM updates. If you run NPM uh, update, it will update all these dependencies to the, la the latest ones. Well, this is, that is not ideal if, if you're running your application in develop and in production because it may break. I may not know which dependencies break, you know, except you use packages like, is this Snake? Snake, we'll talk about Snake later on, or not now, but that's just the use of this, uh, This, I think it's carrot, I've not forgotten, it's carrot, something like that, yeah. So that is basically the use. Yeah, Mose, go on. Sir, uh, okay. what happens if you don't use the use strict? Are you supposed to be asking me this question? No, no. I'm not supposed to. <laughs> okay. Like, I just want you to explain it, like, better. I've actually checked it out, too. Okay. Do okay. you know that uh, JavaScript is is it's, it's a loose uh, language? It's not typed. It's not uh, strongly typed. And that's the reason why TypeScript, uh, TypeScript was invented. Okay. okay. So there are errors that JavaScript we, sim we silently throw without letting you know. Uh, you can remember in our uh, in our previous class, we we're trying to identify an error with um, an error with, in which we did not e import uh, the HTTP module, and we were getting a silent error. If you make a request, it will simply throws an internet server an internet <laughs> server error, something like that. But had it been we used use strict JavaScript, we notify us that yes, we've not installed this package, so we should. If you, Sorry, we've not imported this uh, module. So we should import it and then use it. That is what is causing that error. So use strict makes JavaScript strict to catch all errors and not throw them silently. Okay. Yes, that's simply the- Thank you so much. That's, that's what I actually needed. Okay, so that's by the way, that's basically what we use use strict for. If I'm not using TypeScript, you may like to include this. Okay, so for instance, let's try to see how use tricks can be useful. Okay, so let us comment out use tricks. And then let's see node source. Slice index JS. Okay, so what is this thing? I is not defined. Okay. Okay, this is in Express and not reference item. Initially, if without using use strict, this will still work. 
but I think they've optimized the language or something like that, or it's because we're using it in Express. But then, this needs to come in. So, okay, say let I know it will work. I wanted to, okay. Now it's, I wanted to see, show you how use tricks can work, but then in objects where, you are using object freeze or object um object freeze or something like that. So if you use those methods and an object, you freeze an object and you want to access it later. JavaScript will not throw an error. It will freeze silently, but you will not know what's happening. But you will just be wondering what happened, not knowing you freeze your your object earlier on. So, but when you use use tricks after freezing your object, then you try to access it again. JavaScript will try an error, telling you that no, you you already frozen this uh object, so you can't access it. That's basically. Maybe you make a little research on use tricks. Okay, so after use tricks, we we'll import Express from uh, Express. We're going to be taking everything bit by bit. And then we see const app is equal to express like so. And then we see mm, we import we configure dot f dot f config like so. For now, no options. We're not passing in anything. Okay, import. Dot m from dot m like so, and then we create oh uh, no dot env file in the root of our project dot env like so, and then we say port is equal to three thousand. We close that. Come down here, then we initialize an empty. Um, no, we just we just simply add dot git ignore file. Dot dot git ignore file. The root of our project. Then we add the node modules. We don't want git to track our node modules, and we don't want it to tra track it, our dot env file. And then we don't want it to track our DS store. As you are working with your app in production. And what else we we don't want our uh, git, we don't want git to track. I think that's all for now. Then we close our git ignore file. Then we come down here, then we say const port is equal to process env dot port, like so. Let me say app listen port a callback function that will be called when we start application. Then we log server running on port port like so. Okay, let's so now let's try to start application C npm run dev. Express that many dev. Okay, server running on port 3000 and it's working. That's great. Okay, so we all know the use of uh, uh, git ignore. It will make git not to track all these files. When you push your project to GitHub, it will not track all these files. This file will not be included. Okay, so that's great. And when you host, you, you push your app to production, you have to manually add these enviro environmental variables in production. There's a, a, a kind of a space or places in production where you can add, add your environmental variables. They will get to that maybe later on if you have if you still have time. Okay, so now we want to structure our application using the MVC software design architecture. 
in this case, MVC is very simple. We use the model. Uh, we're not using the model here because the model will be it will be named Prisma. Prisma is a model, so we'll not name the the the, the folder model, but it will be named Prisma. Then we we'll use our controllers, the model view controllers. We use our controllers to handle our application logic. When the the the, the, the controllers will trigger, what happens is. Controllers triggers the model, and then the model triggers the view to display the display the user the user's request the response. The user will send the request, then the controllers will trigger the model. The model will trigger the view, which the view will then send back the response to the user. I I think you should make a, a little request on the model view controller um, software architecture design. So it's a little bit uh, a little bit complex, but in our case, that's simply what it does. And the view, we don't have the view. The view is the front end of our application. It's as that is the view. So in this case, we need to first of all structure our application. Then we have a we controllers folder, controllers, and then we have the route folder, route. And what else do we need? We need the utils, the utils folder for writing our utility functions, utils folder. And then we need the library folder. This, this folder is simply using configuring our uh, some third party libraries installed um, to use in Express. We'll see that in a minute. And then what else do we need? I think that's our Prisma. The Prisma folder will be automatically added to us. Okay, so in our controllers, we have um a file name task. And when in our uh, next class, or let's say in, in our subsequent class, we will try to add uh, authentication to our application. We know we see the use of naming these files like this in our controllers folder and then the routes and the rest. So we have our controllers folder. And then I would the task file inside. Let's come to our route and add task file as well. And the first thing we we'll do is use strict because we're not using TypeScript. And then the controllers as well use strict because we're not using TypeScript. And then we we'll come down to what else do we need? And then in our labs, we, we create a file Prisma, Prisma JS, like so, and then use strict. We are not writing too much logic inside this file, but then we use the use strict here to make it um, a convention for us that we keep using. Anytime you want to use plain JavaScript, you want to include this. Okay. So now it's time to install Prisma and then set up our database. Okay, I think you will need to take a look at Prisma documentation. Um, I think, let me leave uh, a link for you. It should be something for you. This is prisma.io. We take a look at the documentation. Okay. Maybe after this class, um, you look at the documentation. You can learn how to. Later on, we discuss how. Working with uh, SQL databases in Prisma differs from working with uh, no SQL databases. Uh, but basically, here we will just work with um, SQL databases. Database, not basically just one SQLite. So, first of all, we we'll install Prisma as a development dependency, npm i dash d Prisma, like so. And then we install Prisma clients that we use to can use to 
make our request, make request to our database in our application. Why is it taking too much time? It's not supposed to take this much time. Okay, and we've installed Prisma. And then now we install Prisma clients that we can use both in development and production. NPMI at Prisma slash clients, like so. Okay. So after installing the Prisma client, it's not supposed to take this time. Okay. While we are waiting, let's try to explain what Prisma client is. While we install um, Prisma to take care of our things for us, the Prisma client, basically, we use the Prisma client to send um, queries to our database. And let's check out our package AC. Let's see if it's well organized. Yes, we have our Prisma client here. We have .env Express, and we have in the dev dependencies, we have node more, and then Prisma. That's great, that's great. And then let's initialize, let's set up our Prisma. So if you want to initialize the Prisma project, like we want to use SQLite as our database. So let's initialize Prisma with SQLite. So we say MPX Prisma initialize dash dash data data source. This is source provider is SQLite, like this. And then if you're using MongoDB, you say data source um, provider MongoDB. Or if you're using MySQL, you say data uh, source provider MySQL. But then we're using SQLite. So we just say SQLite, like so. And then we hit enter. Then you notice something here. You see that our Prisma folder will be I, can you see Prisma and that's sweet. And we have uh, start database URL EAV file to point to your existing database. The database has no table. See Prisma DB pool, Prisma generates. We'll see all that in a second. It will come to our Prisma folder. Then we have a schema file. In our schema file, we can see data source DB. And inside the DB, we have provider SQLite. And the URL is, is in the EMV file, which is the database URL. Now, if you check our EAV file, we see database URL, which is file db, dev.db. Now, what Prisma does, it automatically add the SQLite database for us under the hood. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go ahead and remove all these comments here so as to make our file more structured, and then more readable. Like so, we have our port and then we have our database URL, which is file dev.db. And then now you cannot see it, but then if we execute our Prisma, we'll be able to see the database file. So, now, the first thing we're going to be doing is uh, write a schema for our task. Then we're going to model, it is called modeling. We'll model our, our, our task. We'll do something like model task. Uh, later on, I will explore Prisma. But for now, let's keep it this way. The name of the, the object you are modeling must be capital. We we'll start with capital letter, like so, like this. I have Prisma extension installed, so everything will be formatted automatically. I advise you install the Prisma extension as well. Search the search here. Then you have Prisma extension. Then you install it. Then first of all, you give it an ID, and the ID is a string. And then it's also an ID. It's a unique identifier, so you make it an ID. And this is the primary key. This is a table. This task here in SQ in SQL is known as a table. And this ID says the unique identifier. So you need to add this add ID here to make it a unique identifier. Then you set, give it a default value. So you have to set it manually. So this default value can be can be auto. Yeah, it can be the auto increment. ID string ID default auto increment, like so. What's happening? What did you see? Oh, oh, oh. If I use if you want to use auto increment, use int like so. And then auto increment. Now, what this auto increment does is because we are using it in production, 
we may likely use to want to use this auto increment because when you create the first task, the ID will be one. When you create the second task, the ID will be two. Well, those, those can cause a conflict in our application in due time. So what we want to do is we want to make our ID not an integer, but a string so that we can learn how to convert strings to integers in our application as well. So what we want to do here, we'll say you, you, sorry, what am I doing? Instead of using the auto increments built in, in, in Prisma, we'll just say UUID. And you know what UUID is? This is built, Prisma has this behind the hood for us, and then it uses it. This will generate some strings of um, some sequence of characters for our user ID. And then what do we want our task to have? Our task will also have a title. And the title will be of string. And then the task will have a description. And the description will be a string as well. And all these are not optional. If you don't add any one, you, you have, if you don't have an, add any one of them, we have, we have an error. And then last but not the least, you have completed, which will be of a Boolean. Um, I want to try to teach you how to use SQLite very well. <clears throat> so completed, which will be a Boolean with a default value, default value of a uh, false, like so. Okay, so we've successfully modeled our task. Uh, SQLite doesn't support enums because in MongoDB or my SQL or Postgres, Postgres SQL, with something like a new, then you have we have completed, completed like so. Then inside here we have a true, and then we have a false. Then you come down here, you see a boolean, completed. You set it to completed, and then Okay, so something like this, but if you hover over this, we see something like error validating. You define the enum completed, but the current connector does not support enums. And this, this simply says SQLite does not support enums. So if I'm using MongoDB or my SQL or other databases, we can use this, but then SQLite does not support. And if you want to use it here, we'll come down here and we say completed like so, and then we say at default, then we just pass in a the false. Can you see it's in capital letter, the false that is coming from the completed so that you don't have to change this any moment. You don't have to pass in any value. It's only those values in here that you can use. So you can see error validating or so, something like that. Okay, so let's do away with this. SQLite does not support um, enums, but then we'll talk about that when we're working with MongoDB. So we successfully modeled our um, our task. So what else do we do now? Okay, are we going to push this or basically? Okay, we will create the table in our database. We we created it, and we are not manually doing this. Prisma. Uh, uh, this this is a way we can do this with Prisma. We can say MPX Prisma migrate dev. And then this migrate dev simply creating a, a, a table. So you can give it a name that is that name of init. This init means your initial um, your initial migration because you have your migration history. So this is basically your initial migration. Okay, so let's hit enter and then let's see what happens. Okay, as you can see, we have a migrations folder, we have our database, devdb, and then we have some other files in there. Then we have a message, environmental variable loaded from .env, Prisma schema loaded from Prisma schema, dot prisma database source db sqli database at file so, so sqli database that created at few uh, excuse me they created that the sql database for us then apply migration so 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 
the migration in its in it. The following migrations have been created and applied from new schema changes, migration SQL. So if you come down here and then open our migration, migration SQL, can you see? I know most of us are not uh, familiar with SQL databases then, but this is how, um, this is basically the SQL uh, syntax, create table, then we have our table task, then ID, text, not null. This, this ID must not be null. Primary key, title, text, not null. Description, text, not null. Then complete a Boolean, not null, and the default value is false. And that is sweet. And uh, you can make something a null label. Had they been, we add, okay, now let's try to play around with this. Let's try to play around with this. Let's make this um, title optional by adding something like this. And then let's come down here and then you rerun something. What am I doing? Like this. And then we see, um, change title to null label and then hit enter. Why you you will, you will, you will want to give your migrations uh, a, a, a describable like a, a kind of descriptive name so that in, 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 you, when you want to check your your migrations or you have an error you just want to stress the history of your migrations you want to know and the, the, the migration folder let's look at the migration folder it carries the name and the dates of the migrations see migrations we have the, this one the time and the dates. The first one is the init. The second one is the change title to null label so that you can say, oh, this is where I changed. So what did I really do in my, in my migration? Then you come down here. Can you see this? Okay. Pragma foreign keys of create a new task. Then title to text. This is null label. So not null. Did you not add it? Not null at the end. Then insert into new task, completed description ID and all of that. Complete issue from task, drop table, task, alter table, new task, rename to task. Okay, this is confusing. I don't want to talk about this. Drop table, the drop uh, table command is to delete a table. But then when they delete a the table, then they create a new table, not really a new table, but then they create a new table from the task table. And they're just applying these new changes to the tax table. But as you can see, our schema did not change. Our schema is still task. They dropped the tax table, then they created a new one. Pragma foreign key check. Pragma foreign key is on. Can you see they turned it off? They applied these changes, then turned it on again. But I don't want to dis dis uh, discuss this in depth because this is pure SQL. And if I start discussing this, you may not like it and it will take much of our time. So that's it for now. And then the Migrations were applied. So let's change it back. Let's come to our schema here and then change this to not null by removing that question mark there and then change this to not null. Change title to not null and then we hit enter again. Then it will create another migration for us. And then this migration's name is change title to not null. Then we'll open our migration, open the migration file. Then we'll come down here. One is made the column title on task require this step will fail if there are existing null values in that column. That is, if at all you are you added some title to your database with the null values and then you change this to not null, it will fail. That's the reason why you are warning you that are warning you. But we don't have any data in our database. Then create table, new task, so so insert into new task. This, this, this. Drop table task, other table, new task, rename, rename the table. What they are do, um, actually doing here is this. They insert into new task this from the, the, the task um, object, the task table. Then they drop the, the task table. So after, when they insert this into the new task. Okay. Pardon, pardon my manners. I was just too fast. They create a table. This the what Prisma does is it creates a, a table of new task. Then it inserts, it copies this all these um fields from the task table and then add it to the new task. Then it deletes the task table. 
then it altered a new task, then rename it to task. And while doing this, it changes the title to not null because it is not null level. So they change it. And then, but while doing this, the pragma foreign keys changes it, it turns it off after altering and doing all of this. Then after remain, renaming the new task to task because this task um, table was deleted. So it then changes the, the new task table to task and then check for pragma key and then turns it on because it was off initially before doing all of this. And this is sweet. As you can see, Prisma is doing this for us under the hood and we don't need to go and write, SQL, uh, even though we don't know the meaning of our, sorry, we don't know how to use SQL raw and queries. We don't need to go and create tables, drop tables inside and do all of this. And then Prisma handles it for us under the hood. Okay, and that's all about migrations. And that is sweet. So what next? Um, I think we've wasted time on migrations. And if you click on your database, database, this file not displays in the text editor because it is either binary or it uses an unsupported text coding. Yes, it is a binary file because SQLite is written in C. This is binary files to store. You don't know how C works works with binary files. So basically, you will not know how Prisma handled binary files in the database. So let's move ahead. Now we've modded our task. And then let's go to our source directly in our library in our Prisma JS. Then we import Prisma client from at Prisma client. And then we initialize it here, we say const. We give it a descriptive name so that we can be able to identify it even later on because database equal to new Prisma client like so. Now we don't have to add anything here, but later on we see how to optimize Prisma queries and then we say we can log requests and all of that. And then here we say export database. Okay, and now we are done with our, um, our Prisma file. So let's close it. And what else? So what we do now, we'll come here into our index file and then we'll import um, Prisma. Let's test our Prisma C. Import Prisma. Oh, no, 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 no. Import Prisma from from live slash prisma that uh, js. Okay, so now we want to make a get request. So let's say app dot get index route the request response like so, and then we see const tasks is equal to database. Can you see database.task? Can you see the task here? Because we named our uh, object name as task. So all these other ones, you don't have to worry about this. The connect and the disconnect is handled under the hood for us uh, in the Prisma client. So we don't need to connect and disconnect. But I'd be, we don't have time for a full Prisma course. I would have taught you how to use the connect and disconnect, execute for and all of that. But that's not it for now. You can take your time out and explore Prisma. Prisma task find this way we'll come to queries find many find first and all of that but what we want to do is find many like so and then we're not handling uh, let's say rest status of um, 200 dot jc tasks okay now let's make a request let's start our server npm Run dev. Okay, it's crashing. Import database Prisma. Okay, it's Pris. Is it Prisma or database? It's Pris. It's uh, let's save it and see. Okay, it's running. Maybe I made a mistake. Okay, that's data. Um, that's the fine many. Okay. Now let's go to our postman and then make a request to 
I want to show you something. It will fail. It will simply an empty object. But it's not supposed to return an empty object. It's supposed to return an empty array. So what is happening here? OK. What's happening here is this. We're supposed to do something like. Express or app use express JSON. Return middleware that only passes JSON and only looks at the request where the content type header matches the type option. That's sweet. Okay. Now let's go back to our request and then send it again. Oops. Send the request. Objects, okay. Maybe let's just do something like uh, app post index route, and let's copy something like this. Comma paste, and let's say const task. Change it to task. It's go to task dot uh, create. Task create like so, and then we have data, and then this data we take in a title of testing, and then description of some testing like so, and then there's two or one created, and then it should return the task to us if you successfully created. Okay, let's just, we don't want to handle this in postman. We just want to handle it, handle it here. Okay, so what we're gonna, we change this request to a post request and then we send it. Okay. Post request, request, request. Oh. Request body. Okay. Data request body. Let's just do something like this. Come here, and then the body. Um, the body here is uh, raw, and it's of uh, JSON. It will create a JSON file, type to testing. Then description. Some testing like so. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so now let's send the request. Send it. Okay. Do anything on our handling that creates data record body. Okay, maybe sorry. Let's make a request. Like this, something we're not handling. That goes through the database. Okay, so let's just leave it for now. I wanted to test it out, but it's like it's giving us a headache. So let's do it the, hard, the, the right way. Okay, now we have app, app, because app with this. Okay, so now what we do is we come to our route, and then we import Express from Express. Let me see, const router. This is where the router middleware comes in. Router is equal to Express router, like so. And then we say export default router. Okay, then we we'll say router dot get the index route and then the re request response. The response on send. Hello router. Next two. 
So we want to use this router in our application. As, as we earlier um, learned how to use router level middleware. This is a router level middleware. And then we want to use it in our application. We want to make it an application middleware. So we'll come down here and then we'll say something like app use. And then we'll do something like this. And then we'll add tasks like this. Then a comma. And we see um, let's say task. So this is a default uh, export. And we know how default export works. It will come down here and see import task from route slash task.js. And that's just it. Uh, this should not confuse you because we earlier learned how we can basically use this. Okay, now let's go back to our route like this. And then let's go to our postman and then make a get request. Make a get request to, let's make a get request. Error cannot get, okay, tasks. Tasks, let's send it. Hello router, and it's working. Okay, so we, wonder if we further want to extract this, we want to make an abstraction here. We want to take this to the controller's uh, folder and specifically in the task file. So what you want to do, you we'll come here, see, we'll give it a name. Say const, const create task is equal to an async function that taking a request, a response, and then, then the response should send, hello, router from controllers, like so. And then we want to export the create task. Um, this should not be confusing you because we try to discuss about it when we're building our task manager in Node.js, and I explained how it basically works. So it should not confuse you. So let's come back to our router here. And then inside of this, we want to say, oh, I'll get this. And then create task, like so. It's coming from the task JS. Make sure you add the JS extension if you want to get an error. And this is it. Can you see how our route, um, the task file in the route uh, folder is minimal? And then the controllers, we handle our logic in here. Okay, so now let's go back and then send a request as well to see what's happening. Send a request again. Hello, router from controllers. Oh, that is sweet. Okay. I am taking it step by step. First of all, made it here. And then I abstracted this to the route. And then I imported it and then handled it here. Okay. Now from the route, I abstracted this function to the controllers, imported it, and then and then handled it here as well. So that we understand everything that is going on uh, under the hood. Okay. So in the controllers, let's create all our function, all the functions we need. Say const. Is it create task? Okay, let's name this a get tasks. Okay, like so. Or then we create create another one, create tasks, create task, async function. So I take in a request, a response, and then does the same thing. Like so. Is equal to okay, like so. And then here we add get tasks. And then we copy this. And then we make it a get task that we get a single task, like so. And then we add it get task. And then we have, of oh, course, um, um, should we name it? Um, 
edit task. Oh, yes, let's say edit task. Is it edit, edit task? Oh, let's, the name is cool. Edit task, then let's copy this and paste it here as well. Edit task, and then we add edit task. And then we copy this, paste it, and then delete delete task like so and then we'll come down here and we'll add delete task okay so it seems our file is complete and now let's go back to our route and then copy this best 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 then get we have get tasks get tasks like so and then we have get task to get a single task by id get task like so and then we have create task and we have edit task edit task like so and then we have delete task edit task not edit task task Okay, delete task. Okay, so our file is almost complete. But then if we want to delete a task, if we want to get a task by ID, we have to handle the ID. So in Express, this is how we get access to IDs. When you send an ID, when you send it, like something like HTTP, blah, 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 3000 slash ID. Let's say ID is one, two, three. Look at the ID slash the ID and the ID is one, two, three, then we get access to it. Okay, that's just it. And then create task, we don't need ID. Edit task, we need an ID. Then delete task, we also need an ID, like so. Okay. So what else? So it's time to start writing something. So we'll come back to our tasks. Then we see, let's undo the create task first, the request body. So import, database from live slash Christmas.js. So what we have, is it the database? Okay, database. And let's check it, take a look at this Prisma file once more. Let's see if I'm not making a mistake. Database, we need Prisma database. Yes, it's the database. This is a task route. Okay, okay. That's true, that's true. Thank you. I did not handle it. Okay. Get, this is a post router.post thank you so much for that correction then router.patch and then router.delete like so okay so we discussed the difference between put and patch and in this case we're not using put anywhere in this application we're just using patch because once you create a task it's either you want to modify it or you want to delete it or they don't want to change the task. If you want to change the task, you create an, a new task instead of changing it entirely. So patch, we're using patch here. Okay, that's it. And then thank you for that correction once, once again. And then we'll come down here, you see, create task. And then, okay, let's log the request body. Okay. Let's log the request body to see what's coming in. And then let's make a post request to these tasks. A post request. And then the body, we have something in the body, like so. So let's send it. Okay. Tied to testing and the description is some testing. It's, it's actually returning an object with the title and description. Okay, so what we're going to be doing here is we'll say, const task is equal to 
is equal to await, and this is the error we were having. We were not using await when we tried to test, um, sorry, to test Prisma in our index file. We were not awaiting for it. We were just doing it synchronously, and that was the reason why we're not getting any response. So go to await database.task dot create. And it creates with where it has a data object. And in this data text an object. So the request body is actually an object. You can you can you can actually see um const new task is equal to request body to make our code more cleaner. And then we remove this and then we say data is new task, like so. And then we send the response. Res want to say, make it adjacent, uh, adjacent response. Res status two o one dot json task. We want to send back the task after being created. Maybe you want to use it for something or something like that. I don't know. Okay, then we come to here to our uh, postman, and then we send this request. Ooh, and we have, can you see, we have created 201 in one in seven milliseconds. Like so, one in seven milliseconds. DNS lookup, socket initialization, DNS lookup, TCP handshake, transfer starts, and then download. Can you see how Postman works? That's another topic for another day. Okay, and the ID is handled for us automatically. The completed is also handled for us um, automatically because we give it an initial value. And the, the completed also will give it an initial value. And this is sweet. Title testing. Okay, now let's create a descriptive task, not some kind of a gibberish and task that we've been doing. You see, add test to create task. Or you see, that we should be more shorter. Test create task um, um method or create task function like so. Then you come here and give it a description of add unit test to to create task function in controllers. And then we make a request. And then we have this task created, task function, and this. And if you notice, this ID is different from a previous ID. So it, the IDs are auto generated for us with all this bunch of our uh, sequence of our uh, strings that can never be identical. So add unit test to task function in controllers and complete at first because you have not done your task and you are lazy. That's why you have not done it. Okay. So let's see how we can then. Do it, but is this correct? Let's see something here. We have let's handle errors. We have a try catch, and then we add this in here, like so. But if we have an error, then we come here. Then we have res status five hundred JSON. Message internal server error. And then let's make this a rec, a rec board, a rec board. And then let's send the request again and see what we've got. Message internal server error. Okay. And that is sweet. Internal server error. We'll change it to body. If we send our request, our task will be created. Okay, but then you see that why doing all this? We are writing these status codes manually. And why in development sometimes remembering the status codes can be a kind of a stressful stuff. So what you want to do is then come here, we we'll stop our our development server, and then we say npmi http status codes. 
I think I'm spelling it well. Okay, let's hit enter and see what we've got first. Okay, I think, okay, we've installed it. Then let's clear our terminal and then start our server again. Then instead of writing this manually, we'll come up here and then we say import status codes from HTTP status code, like so. Then instead of saying your status 201, we just say status code dot uh I should have this correctly. Codes. Okay, let's make it the code. So I think that is the correct uh, transition. So just codes that um, I have created. And when you scroll to created, you see it's the code that created is equal to 201. The request has success, succeeded and a new resource has been created as a result of it. This is typically the response sent after a put uh, request. Put, is it a put or? The request and so a new resource has been created as a result of it. And put and post are almost the same. A new resource, as you can see the English here, a new resource has been created as a result of it. A new resource, a, the post creates create a new resource and the put creates also a new resource. Also create. And so then we'll come down here and we'll see status code dot uh internal server error and then if you hover over it you see that actually status code the instance is equal to 500 so these are descriptive names so that even if you forget the status code all you need to do is just status code that sees you and then you get your your result okay now as you can notice if we make another let's say we want to get all the tasks And in this case, the request comes in. Then we see const tasks. First of all, try catch block. And then let's copy this. And then the message is error pitching tasks like so and then you come up here then you try I will say um, const tasks is equal to database dot task dot find many we are finding many that's all we are finding all the tasks then you say rest dot status Status code dot uh, uh, is it what is that? Um, is this success? No, the 200 is um, let's check it here 201. Okay, mm. how am I forgetting the status code for 200? Okay, um, no content accepted. Or is it? Um, you know what? I've forgotten the status code for 200. So that's um, 202. Okay, we're not just gonna leave it. We're gonna look for it and find it. I use it. Once seen it, I can. Uh, hi. It's okay. Status code dot okay. Look at me. Just okay, and I'm forgetting. I'm forgetting totally. Jason. And then we say tasks like so. I want to send back the tasks. And okay, let's come down here. And then make a request to get. A get request to get the tasks and then we send. Okay, maybe this is a mistake of await. Always making this mistake. Await and then we come down here and then send the request again. And as you can see, we have an array. 
an array of tasks. We have ID, title, testing, description, some testing. Then we have the second task, ID, title, test, test create task function. I, I made a mistake is create task function and I added test first and then add unit test to create task function in controllers. And then as you can see, this is just an array, but then you may want to get something like tasks. You want to make it an object so that you can add other things. Let's say you, you, you want to add a count. Let's just make it a count of zero for now. And then let's make the request again. Then you have tasks. Tasks is an array. Then you have a count of zero. Okay. And this, this is a good a good practice. Let's remove this for now and then leave our tasks there. Like so. We have our tasks. And then you can see that anytime we are creating, we are wasting time handling errors and then writing manual um code um, manual error messages and all of that. But it's a way can we can go about this. And we can go about this by creating a, a function that can handle this um, for us. And then that function, we can create it, um, let's say in the, let's add an error directly here. Let's say folder errors, like so. So in the errors, and then we create another, we create another folder, middleware, where we can write all our middlewares. So let's just leave it a middleware. And then what we want to do is come to these errors, and then we name this function. Um, what is the name? Let's see. First of all, we create note. Note found should be in the middle. Uh, let's say custom error API JS, like so. So what we'll be doing in this file is we will extend the error API. You say class custom error API extends, extend error. You know that the error, um, Error is an object. So we can extend, uh, actually a class, so we can extend from it like so. So we have our constructor. The constructor takes in the message, which is coming from the error, and then status code. So inside of this constructor, we want to uh, then initialize the message that is coming from the error. You say super message, like so. So we can now make use of the message that is coming from this error object. You can see error, then we're saying error constructor, and that's sweet. Then we'll see, then we'll <clears throat> initialize our status code to say, this the status code is equal to status code, like so. And then we we'll say, export um, custom um, error API like this, and then we are done with this errors file. And then we'll go back to our middleware. In our middleware, we'll go to our error handler. Okay. Error handler. Where's our middleware? Create a new file. Error handler middleware. Yes, like so. <laughs> And then first of all, we import our custom error API. Let's add a JS here, dot JS. And then later in, uh, when we start discussing how to make our projects more fun, and then how to work with different developers on the same projects, and then how to maintain uniform syntax and all of that, we learn how to remove all these dots and then we make it, um, we we'll get there, we we'll, we'll do all those things. Then from here, we we'll create a function, which is um, error handler. Don't mind me that I'm using both regular functions and then uh, arrow functions. It's a development environment where 
it is advised to use either regular functions or only arrow function, except where it's a special case to use regular functions, why you are using arrow functions. But here I'm mixing it. And then later on, we say we can deal with that request response. This error handler takes in four arguments. The, the error object, the request object, the response object, then the next function, because it is a middleware. Then you come down here, then you see if error that is coming in is, is, is an instance, it's an instance of the custom custom error API. Remember, we are, we are inheriting this custom error API from the, the, the error. We're inheriting all the error made, uh, made, made, uh, error methods. So we're using them in this custom error API. So if error is an instance of error, which you, this is coming from the error object. So we're checking. So if it's an instance of error, what we want to do is return response that uh, status of um, error dot status code. I don't need to tell you where the status code is coming from. Because if it's an instance of this error, it has all these properties. If it's an instance of this error, it has the message and the status code. So if it's an instance of it, then we'll make use of it. Then dot JSON, JSON message, error dot message, the message that we inherited from the error object, and then we'll pass it to this custom error API. But if it is not, we'll return a response, your status, of um five hundred dot JSON message and if there's no error dot message and then we we'll simply default it to internal server error. But though we handled it here, if there's an error message, that means it's an instance of this custom error API, but then let's just leave it like this. Now, what am I doing here? Like this. And I'm not telling you anything about this operator. You go and research about this operator. But instead of using something like this, you can use this. But I'm not gonna say any word about it. And instead of using this 500, let's make this a convention and then import status codes from HTTP status code. Then you see status codes dot uh, internal server error, like so. And then we export our error handler, like so. Okay, so. Now we'll go back to our index JSON. But before then, let's just, uh, let me show you something in a bit. Let's make a request to slice task instead of tasks. And let's see what we've got. Look at what we are getting. A whole bunch of uh, HTML file which cannot get this, this, this. So we need to handle this. So we'll come to, we create a, mid a middleware that will handle that for us. Can you see how we are creating middlewares and how useful they are? We create a middleware that will handle that for us. Then we say, um, not found JS. And see, function not found. Sorry, not found. It's taking a request and a response. Then the response, the status. Okay, now we need status. So we import 
status code from there and then they will say status code dot not found like so not found but uh send this is not a json file route does not exist like so and then we export not found and then let's go back to our index and then we are going to handle this down here app use not found and then it automatically imported itself from the middle where not found okay um, the reason why we're handling it down here is because this will get past all these middlewares and the route will not be recognized. So when you get to this place, it's just this middleware will handle this. Where is it? Um, the not found middleware. That goes, where's our send? So it's called not found, route does not exist. And that is why we're handling it down, 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 because this route does not exist, not found. And then it will notify the user that it does not exist. So let's make a request again. Route does not exist. Wow. Can you see? Because we are making a request to a route that, that does not exist. Okay. So we've successfully handled our. Wow. We've um, successfully handled our not found middleware. So now it's our error handler. So how do we handle errors? We, we want to catch errors, but then we want to catch it down here after everything that process. There's, there's the reason. So in here, in our middleware stack, the, the, the middleware that are on top will send down, um, we pass the control to the next middleware with an error the request object, error object, request object, the response object, and the next function. So that next will simply pass control to the below um, middleware function. So when passing it, we pass with an error. So what we want to handle is the error. So before it that uh, request get to this error handler means there's an error and that error cannot be handled. So we then handle it in our error handler function. But this way we can go about this um, error, handler um, function of a thing. But then, before going about this error handler function, we will create another function that will take care of all these things, that will take care of uh, handling this error for us. And that we pass, anytime there's an error, we pass it to the error handler to to like um, handle it uh, for us. So that is what we're gonna be implementing now. And in order to handle those errors successfully, we will use the express, um, express uh, async errors, something, yes, the package, the third party package is express async errors. Okay, so, now, let's come down to our index.js file. App use error handler, like so. Okay, so anytime there's an error, uh, we create a function here in the controllers that anytime there's an error, it will pass it to this error handler, then the error handler will automatically handle it for us. But then before we go about that, we'll, let's implement the error handler that we can, sorry, not the error handler, the, the, the our, our wrapper that we can wrap around all these asynchronous functions that will pass down the error to this uh, error handler function to handle it for us. You can see that, 
the the the, the object is coming in with the, with an error object, the request object, and the response object. But what we are interested in is the error object, so that then it will pass in the error object, it will process it. If the error is an instance of this custom error API, this is what you send the, the error, the status code, and the, the error that message. But if it's not, then we send back the status code of 500 with, the, with an internal server error. And let's just remove this. I wanted to notify you about this operator. Then you go and make a research about it. It is called the callless, is it the callessing operator or something like that? Okay, so you can search for it on Google or any source at all. <clears throat> then we handle it here. But then before that, we come to our middleware, then we, we make a middleware that will pass these errors to the next, to the error handler to handle it for us. And then inside this middleware, we, we, we simply just, this is an async wrapper because we're going to be wrapping it around our async object. And then we don't have much time, we don't have much time, but after this function, I will implement it. Then we leave the rest of our HTTP and methods, the delete, the edit, and the rest for to be handled later on. You see, it's our async wrapper. Inside our async wrapper, we make a function of uh, async wrapper like so, and then we pass in a function as a parameter. And then this function will return an asynchronous, sorry, an asynchronous uh, function. It will return an asynchronous function that will take in the re a request, a response, and the next function. And then this asynchronous function, we use a try catch block to catch errors. Then we will await this function. We call this function with the request, response, and the next. I'm not going to explain this in depth. This is not. This is, not, this is a JavaScript thing, not Express thing. So what I'm doing here is I'm passing in a function in this uh, async wrapper function as a parameter. Then I'm returning another function that returns the request, the response, and the next. Then this re request, response, and next, I will call this function that I passed in here as a parameter with all these uh, arguments, the request, response, and the next argument. But if there's an error, what I want to do is I want to call the next, this next um, function that is coming in here. I want to call it with the, the error object so that it can pass this error to our error handler to handle it for us. Okay, so now we are done with implementing our async wrapper. They will come down here, then we say export async wrapper like so. So why we export our async wrapper, we come down to our controllers in our task, and then we do something like this. We will eliminate this, let's remove this like so, and then we eliminate this try catch block. And then this async function, what we do is paste this here, and then cut this async function, and then write your async, wrapper like so and then paste in the async function like so wow that was a lot of work okay and now let's see we have instead of task we have tasks to get all the tasks and then let's make a request or oh, no let's instead of tasks we have let's say we have board and not body board like so and then let's make a request to create a new task with postman post tasks and then we we'll make a request message internal server error wow 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 and our error handler no, we did not add this to our, we cut this here as well. We remove this one, we paste this one. Then we remove our function to we'll add our async wrapper, like so. Then we pass in our function, like so. 
going to remove this. Okay, then we come down here. Then we make the request. Make the request again. Oops, is our server up and running? It's running. Okay, this is create tags, but make the request. And it's working. As you can see, our async wrapper is working. So we add back our body. And then we come, <clears throat> we come to Postman. And in Postman, we will remove test like this. And then we send this again. And then 201 created test and all of that. And our async wrapper is working. So I want to go over this once more and then we call this ID. We'll come to our Midwest, come to our error handler. So what this error handler is happening, sorry, what this error handler is doing is it's accepting the error request response and the next uh, argument from our top level middleware. It doesn't know what that middleware is, but what it knows is if there's an error, the middleware will pass in an error object, the request response to, 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 to it. So when it passes, it also pass, um, it will pass error request and response. Then it will take in, uh, it will not pass a next function, but it will take in a next function. So as to pass um, is, um, the, the incoming error. And we don't even need this next function because it's not passing to anything. The error will be terminated here, but we need the, the next um, error in this async wrapper. Here, we will wrap our function inside the function we are passing in, let's say in the controllers here. This is the function, that fn, that fn is this function. So then our async wrapper, it will take in this fn, then it will return a function with this request response and next. And this, this will be passed into this fn, the request response and next. Then the function will be executed. So if there's an error, this will pass this error to the next function. And if there's an error, there's no other function to handle this error than the error handler. So when it passes this, it, it, pass, it passes it with the error. The next function it passes with the error. So we accept this error here, then we process it. And we're processing it. Okay, let's say instant, internal, internal error. Let's remove this server and then save it. And then try to see if it's working properly. And let's make it a board. In our controllers, come here and make it um, board, not body. Okay, and then send this request. Internal error. Okay, as you can see, when this this async wrapper encounters this error, it will pass it to the error handler. Then the error handler will handle it. You can see we have internal server error here because the error is not. Um, it's not the type of uh, the error we inherited from. So it will simply come here, status code internal server error, that is 500. And if we check our postman, we have 500 internal server error. And then we have our internal server error here, like so. So that is basically, if you're confused, you can go ahead. Uh, we've explored how um, middlewares work. So this is middleware. As you can see in the index here, we are handling it down below. It's after this that we're handling this. So if an error occurs in the task um, route, task router, it will pass it to the app, and this app will then forward it to this error handler, and this error handler will handle our app. But then if you send a request to a route that, that does not exist, this error handler does not handle routes. So it will pass all these uh, middleware and then get to the node found, um, middleware and then the middle, this not found middleware, we handle our our not found route, something like this. Route does not exist and something like that. Okay, so for today, we're going to be stopping here. I think we've gone very far and we know how middleware work in Express, how we can implement the router level middleware. 
now we are basically using the router level middleware here. But later on, and we're making use of the router level middleware and we're making use of the, the application level middleware, which is the error handler, the node found, and then the use task. We are using the router in our application. And then later on, when we want to implement uh, authentication and authorization, we will make use of the route level middleware, which we will have to pass in the, we will not pass it here. We we'll come to our route and then we we'll pass it in here. Let's say we have the authentication, then we we'll pass it like this so that to process our authentication before we can be able to create or get us something like that. And we've come to the end of this class. So any questions before we end the class?